Good Wednesday to everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and we're here with our Wednesday Bible study. Before I begin, I want to say some words before we begin my introduction. Uh, there are some people I want to talk about as far as friends I know and others that I want to shout, make some shout outs to maybe and, and uh, think about them in prayers. That's basically what I'm doing with this. Uh, there's some like Ronald McNeil that he was a watcher of these videos many times, and he likes a lot of these videos that we post on here at the Meek Street Church of Christ. And he recently lost his brother and his mother, and both of the, their passing was very hard on him. And I, I talked to him about this a little bit, and it is hard because that is a very terrible loss to lose both of those loved ones, and that was his family. And, and so we want to say our prayers are with you, Ronald, and hope that you'll get through this holiday season. And I know it's hard with Thanksgiving and Christmas and times like this when we lose loved ones, it makes it more difficult to get through the holidays because of that. And there's some others, uh, uh, workers that I used to work with, like Joe Fitch, and he's had some that he talked about to me that had the COVID, and hopefully they're getting better. And it hasn't really affected a lot of people. This COVID-19, the coronavirus, as I know, I've suggested that this is one of those things we have to deal with, that there's times of sickness and pandemic that we see in our lives, and we have to simply do what we can because of that. And God's with us, and I believe our prayers are heard by God, and we can do all that we can in service to Him. And hopefully, with His help, this pandemic will all go away. And our prayer is that that will happen, that no one else will have to get sick and especially die because of this pandemic. I want to talk about today uh, a lesson that really talks about the Christian's hope and how we are to have this hope in Christ and in God and in all that we do in service to him. And we look at our lessons that we do each and every time. I decided to wait until the beginning of the year to pick up our lessons on the great words of the Bible. I thought about starting back, back in uh, January, the first Wednesday in January. And so we'll start back that particular study at that time. For now, we're going to study about hope today and the lesson called The Christian's Hope because that's what we do. We have a hope and a, an expectation. We'll look and see that's more stronger than simply wishful dreaming, and it's stronger than just simply having, well, I hope to go to heaven. Well, if we look at the Bible, we see that's stronger, quite a bit stronger than simply guessing or and just simply leaving it to chance, as God wants us to know that we are on the road to heaven and that we fully expect to go to heaven. That's really what the definition really brings us to, to have that feeling, that comfort because of our hope in Christ and God. And if we don't have that hope, we need to have that hope in our heart, in our lives. Let's look at what is hope. First of all, look at the definition that Vines gives us is favorable and confident expectation. When you fully expect, and it's a favorable outcome that something will happen and it's supposed to happen, and it does happen. At least in our minds, it's, it's still future, but it's still an expectation that we have. And Bynes tells us its hope describes that happy anticipation of good. And that's exactly what the Bible gives us, is that good news of salvation, but not only that, but also that home in heaven is where we will eventually be, and that we can leave this world behind, and we don't have to worry about all the bad things that happen on this earth because we have a favorable anticipation of something better when this life is over. And it has to do with the unseen and the future. Oftentimes we think that something we don't see right now, but it's something that will happen. And the Bible even pictures that way. Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25 says, For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he already sees. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. And that's exactly what really describes the hope of every child of God is to go to heaven, something we don't see right now. We don't know what it looks like. We're, we've never been there before. 
but God promises that place. And therefore we've been saved and we have that hope um, an expectation of that anticipation of what's good that God would give us in the future, a great place with him throughout all the endless ages. And God describes what that hope is all about. That's what this lesson is about is things that we often will say. We know the scriptures that say these words, but do we internalize that? Do we really believe and have this hope that we need to have? Because that's exactly what we need to have is because God wants us to fully have the kind of faith and it's connected to our faith. How much we believe in God is how much we can have that hope. If we don't believe in God at all, then there's no hope. There is no anticipation of good things that God can give us because we have to be a, a one, a person that believes in God and like Hebrews 11 verse six, it says without faith is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and reward of those that diligently seek. I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but we'll get to that verse in just a little bit. But hope described. Well, first of all, I want to talk about some of the scriptures and just briefly say Peter describes in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, as that children of God have a living hope. All Christians have a living hope. It's not a dead faith, a dead hope, but it is a living hope that we have. The Bible gives us, and God gives us that living hope. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Titus refers to it as, actually Paul to Titus refers to it as a, a blessed hope. And it's a promise of Jesus coming. That's what he's referring to there. The, come, the great coming of Jesus, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is when he comes. That will be the fulfillment of all the hope. And he'll receive, give us all the promises. We'll receive those when Jesus comes. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, the Bible refers to as a good hope. And that's exactly what it is. It's a good hope. It's a favorable hope, something that we want. As children of God, we want and expect the good things that God would give to us. And Hebrews chapter 7, verse 19, refers to it as a better hope. He's actually comparing the Old Testament ways and things with the New Testament. And there are better promises, better conditions, better faith, and a lot of things. And so we have a lot to, to be thankful for in the New Testament age in which we are living today. We have better covenant, better promises, and we have the great lawgiver, Jesus Christ, who gives us all good things. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 refers to this hope as a sure and steadfast hope. It's built upon the rock. We'll talk more about that particular passage in the lesson today. But I want to talk about there's a strong connection between, like I said, between our faith but also our hope and trust. And oftentimes they are used synonymously uh, as no words, as the same words, hope and trust synonymously in the scriptures uh, to hope as here's what the definition of actually what Vine says about this to hope is not infrequently translated in the King James version by the verb to trust. And so it oftentimes it's mentioned to trust. It means to hope in the things of God. And like in Luke chapter 24, verse 21, when the, the ones who were walking on the road to the Maus, they met Jesus and they began a conversation with Jesus. And they said, but we trust it. In other words, we hope. That's what the New American Standard Bible of that particular verse says. Uh, there's several, maybe the other modern translations have this as well. Oftentimes the ESV has many times the same render or close similar rendering as the New American Standard Bible. It says, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. And so they're basically telling Jesus himself, it was him that we were hoping that he would be the one that was the redeemer, who would redeem Israel. And they had lost their hope in a lot of ways because of his crucifixion. That's really why he expounded the scriptures to them and helped them to see that it was really God's plan to have a crucified Savior to offer his blood for the redemption of his people. As Isaiah 53, 
describes Jesus as being that one. In Romans chapter 15, verse 12, the Bible speaks in prophecy, Isaiah. Actually, Paul is referring back to Isaiah and talk, talking about what the prophet Isaiah said. He says, again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. That says a lot about who Jesus would be as he's going to bring in, not only be a savior to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And that means a lot to you and I who were never born in the family of Israelites. And so we have that, we have that trust. We have that hope in Jesus Christ that brings both Jews and Gentiles together in one body, the church that Jesus built. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says this, says, who delivered us from so great a peril of death. As many times when Paul was out preaching, he would be uh, stoned and people who would be gathered mobs trying to kill him or like those some that did, they had a hunger fast, would eat or drink, not until Jesus actually, until Paul rather, was taken and killed. And so they made a, a vow that they would not eat or drink until Paul was dead. But here, Paul would say, he was delivered from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. That's really the most important part about this verse. Have you set your hope on Jesus? That's really the question of the hour. That's really what the, this lesson is really about, is to help you to see the need to set your hope on Christ and on God. We live in a world that's, that's oftentimes very... Uh, very troublesome. There's a lot of tribulation in this world. There's a lot of, of problems this world has to offer to us. And there, there's some good things. You know, God has something better, a place called heaven that we can set our hope and our trust, put all of our eggs in that basket. I use that phrase quite a bit because it describes what people do. They put all their emphasis, they buy all the stock, if you will, in one place. And that place needs to be in the Bible and God. And he will deliver us. It's what Paul says, and yet, and he will yet deliver us. And so he was talking about how God had delivered him from people that were trying to hurt and do harm to him. And yet he was setting his hope on God. And that's where it needs to be. And like all of us, we need to have that same kind of commitment that Paul has there in this verse. Now go back to this idea of Hebrews 11, verse 1. I jumped ahead in the lesson, but there's really a strong connection to our faith and hope. As Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines really what faith is. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I want to look at another translation. This is Moffitt's translation. We really don't use that very much, but he says, now faith means we are confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. And that, in a lot of ways, that can be looking at the really not the, the actual words, but it kind of gives us a meaning of what is being said. You know, we are confident. When you're confident in what you hope, you have the conviction. Now, there's the idea of conviction, things we are convinced of. We need to be convinced of, of heaven and what God offers us. And if we're not there, then we're not going to have the hope that we need to have in Christ and in God. In Romans 15, verse 13, here Paul would say, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit did many signs and wonders back in the time of the first century where people were uh, raised from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to cause people to believe. And so that caused people to have hope. Those miracles by the Holy Spirit back then helps us. We read about those in the scriptures. We know that God was working with men, and men were believing and having hope in the God of the Bible and in his Lord and Savior, his son, Jesus Christ. And so we understand we need to abound in hope. What does that mean to abound in hope? It means that we have hope, and not just a little hope, but it, it's growing hope that we have in God, and we're, we're, our life should be abounding in hope every day, and not to give up our hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is our 
faith and hope based on? Well, faith and hope is based on several things. That's really what this lesson's about. It's about the things that really gives us this good hope. First of all, God's word, we'll look at in a moment, and God's promises. This is kind of an outline of the rest of the lesson today. And it's God's character also gives us some reason to hope and, and to have faith in God based upon that. And also God's power. As we think about God's character, God's power, does he have the ability to do what he says that he can do and will do? And if he doesn't, then we can have hope in someone. And that's, that's really what the Bible is telling us. We need to have that strong hope on God who does have the character and the power to help us in our times of need. And so we'll look to God's word first of all, as we think about our hope based upon God's word. In Psalm 119, verses 41 down to 43, the Bible says, let your mercies, David said, come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. And David's really saying a lot about, you know, in Psalm 119, I say this often, it's all about God's word. Psalm 119 is teaching us to trust, like David trusts. And when he says those things, do we feel the same way? Do we have this same kind of hope that's based upon the word of God itself, because that's how God communicates to us. He doesn't give us dreams and visions and, and all kinds of ways to speak voices in our head. No, that's not how God speaks to us. He speaks simply through the word of God, and that's how the Spirit directs uh, those men to write the inspired word, which is now complete. That's why we don't have people who say, well, I'm speaking by inspiration today. Well, if they say that, we know that's not true, because the days of inspiration where people were writing down scripture and writing down this idea of what is the Bible itself has been completed. First Corinthians 13 says that when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part, we're talking about the prophecies and the inspirations, all that was implied with the spiritual side of, of the, how the spirit, the gifts of the spirit back then. And so all that has ceased, as Paul would say, that we now have the complete revelation of God's word. And that's our basis of our trust is in that word today. In Psalms 119 verses 80 and 81, he says, let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes that I may not be ashamed. My soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. And that's exactly how we need to also think that we let our heart be blameless regarding God's word today, the New Testament. We're not under the Old Testament, but yet David was. And yet we understand the New Testament is where we put our trust. And, and we look at the, at, the, at the books of the Bible, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and other the letters that Paul wrote, the prison epistles of Paul, all of those are inspired for us. And there's where we have the trust and the hope, and there's a lot of things said that was not said in the Old Testament. As we often think about, we're given better, we might say more revelation about our Savior. And you know, they saw through that glass darkly in a lot of ways. Even those who were receiving the revelation, Paul said, we now see through a glass darkly. But yet we now have, looking back on this, we now have all the books of the Bible that helps us to know that there is a God and how to serve Jesus in the New Testament way today. And so we must also think about it this way. We're not going to be ashamed of the gospel. We would go to Romans 1, verse 16 today to talk about how that we're not ashamed. Like We can say like David and even Paul, that we're not ashamed of who we are, ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. And that's also the idea is that we long so deeply and so much for the idea of salvation, the, the salvation that God gives us. And it's where to be found. It's in the word, just like it was for David. It's in the word of God today that we find this salvation. In Romans 15, verse 4, the Bible says, For whatever things were written before, talking about the Old Testament scriptures from Genesis all the way to Malachi, they were written for, before, for our learning 
that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And that says a lot about what the scriptures can do. You want hope, you want patience and the comfort of the scriptures to give you that, that hope. That's what it will lead to. When you read the Bible, you read about Jesus dying on the cross and the reason why he died on the cross. He says, when I'll be lifted up, I will draw all men to me as John 12 teaches us. And so the Bible tells us a lot about how we can have that hope. Are you drawn to Jesus because of the hope of the scriptures, the patience and the comfort of the scripture? Now he's talking about the Old Testament, but yet even that leads to Christ. Isaiah 53, if you read that, does it not give you hope and, and comfort in the scriptures to have that hope because of what Jesus did on the cross? Isaiah spoke hundreds of years before Jesus went to the cross. And that's how we can have the hope in God because we know that that's who is spoken of there. And I, Acts chapter 8 makes it very clear to us that when the Ethiopian eunuch was saying, well, I don't understand who is this. Is the prophet talking about himself or some other man? That That's when the Bible tells that Philip began to preach Jesus to him. And he taught him to have that hope that Jesus gives us in the New Testament age. And so God's promises also are what gives us this, this hope today. Our hope and our faith is built on, and like standing on the promises. I love that song because it, it teaches us about God's promises and how that we need to stand on them. That means the foundation of everything that we do is because I know Jesus is offering us salvation. And that promise that he made to us to give us eternal life and God who promised us. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to begin there first before we go on. Hebrews chapter 11. Here the Bible speaks about there. Begin with verse 8. This is a little lengthy reading, 8 to verse 19. But it says a lot about the promises that were made to Abraham. Notice what it says in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed to, by, by going out to a place which he was received for inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land, a land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. As we read this, I want you to think about the word hope that's underlying everything we're talking about here in these verses. What did Abraham hope for? He hoped for something better than what he was given even as he's walking through the land of Canaan, the promised land. That was not all, the end all of everything that Abraham hoped for. He wanted to go to a place that God would prepare a place in heaven, which the Bible says, which has foundations, its architect and builder is God. And that's where Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, as John 14 also talks about there. But it goes on to say, by faith, even Sarah received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, they had, again, a promise of a son. That's one of the promises that. God fulfilled. He fulfilled the land promise to Abraham. He fulfilled the son promise in Isaac. It was not through Ishmael that they, the promise was fulfilled, but yet it was through not man's way. As we think about what Sarah tried to do, she tried to hasten the promise. Right? She tried to do it their way and not God's way. But God said, I'm going to give you a son, and it's not going to be by Hagar. It's going to be by Sarah, and his name was Isaac. And so the Bible says she, she hoped in that promise. She trusted in God that God said what he meant and meant what he said. Let's read on. The Bible says, therefore, verse 12, therefore was, there was born even one man and, and him as good as dead, at that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. You know, sometimes we understand the promise has to wait, even after death. If we're not here when Jesus comes, that, him, that promise of him coming and receiving us to himself, we'll have to wait on that till he does come. And so we, like them, died not receiving the promises while we're living here on this earth. 
that says all these died in faith. I'm about the Old Testament ones, those ones of faith that he mentioned in Hebrews chapter. We're going to talk about all in Hebrews chapter 11. He goes on to talk about, again, it says, uh, having welcomed them, having seen them, having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they would have had opportunity to return. It says a lot about when you're leaving and you're taking faith in what God says, the promise, and you're not looking back. You're not looking at that, that, that old place, the familiar, but you're going on to the unseen. And that can be scary at times. It takes faith to do that. It takes a hope and trust in God that he will perform what he says he will do. And notice what it says, verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom he, it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise up people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. And I want to stop right there and say, that's the end of our reading, but what, what the Bible's saying here is God gave, God gave Abraham a promise, and yet even though he had to go and offer seemingly the end of that promise, you know, Abraham said, you know, even if God has to raise him from that, he's going to fulfill that promise, even if he has to do that. That takes a lot of trust because most time we think of death as completely final. That that's going to end the promise of anything, just like the death of Christ. Some thought that was the end of the promise of the redemption of Israel, but it wasn't. It was not the end of that, of God's promises because God fulfills his promises. And that's what Abraham found out. And also we find out as well. And we look back at all the other promises. God has never relinquished or relented on any of these promises. He's never reneged or said something, well, you know, I'm gonna, not going to do what I said I was going to do. And yet God keeps his promises. That's, that's based upon the scriptures. And, and we find these promises in the scriptures. It's based upon God's word. In Acts chapter 26, verses 6 and 7, here, Paul is before King Agrippa and, and for the council there. Uh, talking about actually before King Agrippa and Festus, the Bible says, And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. That's the reason why they've given them over to, to be judged by King Agrippa. And and Festus, the governor, was there as well. And so this hope, Paul mentions that hope of every Jew was to have the redemption of Israel. They didn't understand how that was going to be accomplished by God, but yet they understood God was going to save his people. It's based upon God's character. We think about hope and the character of God and how that God cannot lie. That's what Hebrews chapter 6 13 through 18 speak of. Let's read those verses. Go back just a few chapters in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's read on. The Bible says in verse 13, for when God made the promise to Abraham, going back to what Hebrews 11 spoke of, he says, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. That's really one of the keys of, of hope is having to wait. And that's what we have to do. There's times that it's not immediate that these promises are going to be fulfilled. Like I mentioned, all those died in faith, not receiving the promises, but yet they embraced them. They looked at something that they held on to, even in death, how that they looked at God and said, you know, God will fulfill. And I think about Joseph said, you know, take my bones with you. Because he knew, he knew for a fact, God said, they're going to leave the land of Egypt. And so he knew for a fact, take my bones with you when you leave this land. That's why they could take Joseph with them because of God's promises. Again, it goes on to say, 
we pick up our reading again. He said uh, in verse 14, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patient way, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves. And with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In other words, when, when the oath is given, that means the promise is made. And that settles it, doesn't it? goes on in verse 17, the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness. And that gets back to the character of God here. God doesn't change. He doesn't like men. One day he means it. Next day he doesn't mean it. That he said it one day, but he changed his mind the next. That's not the way God is. God is a rock. God means what he says and says what he means. And he doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind about these things. The Bible goes on to say, in the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by the two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Notice that. It is impossible for God to lie and, and say one thing and do another. That's not what God says. That's not what, how God works, in other words. We have taken refuge, would have strong encouragement, take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. I read on the verse 19, but we'll read that just a little bit. But what he's saying here is there's two unchangeable things which are possible for God to lie. And so it's one of the things he said, and he swore by himself that he would perform that. And so God's character is on trial with his promises. And he is going to fulfill that because of the fact that God is a just and merciful and loving God. And yet he's one who, who's a holy, righteous God who does right always and always will always do the things that he says. In Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, here again another passage you read about hope and of salvation. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifest even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. Here, Paul is talking about, again, the fact that God can't lie and that the gospel gives us that hope and it says so much about the fact that you can have a home in heaven. That's a promise of eternal life that God will give you. And that's, that, that settles it, doesn't it? When God says that, you know it's real. It's not something that, well, I don't know if it's going to be secure or not because God can't swear about any greater than himself. And so that's the point of Hebrews 6 as well. But God's power also is behind this hope that we have. So we think about our hope. You know, if I had someone that, that could not do, didn't have the ability to do what he said, then I couldn't have any trust in that person. You know, have you ever had somebody like that that simply could not do what they said they could do? It's hard to trust someone like that if they let you down, especially. But in Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21, read these verses. It says, in hope against hope, he believed. Talking about Abraham, going back to the promise of Abraham and Isaac and how he's taking Isaac on the mountain to, to offer him to God. As God said, you take your son, your only son, the son of of your love, and you go out and you you take him and offer him as a sacrifice. Yet God stayed his hand, of course, but yet Abraham was willing to do what God would do with Jesus Christ. But here the Bible says what was in the mind of Abraham, in hope against hope. And I love that phrase because it mentions the fact that he hoped what seemed to be something that you couldn't put a lot of trust in, but he hoped against hope. He believed so that he might become a father of many nations. I think it's going back to the idea that, that God would raise him. Going to back to the idea that Hebrews 11 speaks of, that even if God had to raise Isaac from the dead, he would do it. And that's why Abraham was able to think, well, you know, I want to kill my son and offer him. In his mind, it was already a done deal. But yet God still, again, the angel stayed his hand from doing that. But also says, so that your descendants be 
Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And again, this hope against hope is referring to specifically about the idea of having a son, Isaac, in the first place, because this was a supernatural happening, just like the idea of, of resurrections from the dead. That's beyond what you and I know of today. And that's something we can't do. We can't raise anybody from the dead. Only God can do that. And so that's why we put our hope in the resurrection and something that we don't have the power to do. We put our power and trust in God who can. If he can have Abraham 100 years old having a child with Sarah who was 99, then we understand God has more power than we do. We can't do that, can we? And yet that's the power of God, even the resurrection. We'll see that one day as it will be played out when Jesus comes back to receive us up to him. Now, verse 20, I'm going to say, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully sure that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. There's a lesson that really is simple. The title is, God is able. I preached last Sunday about, are we able or not? And that's some question about, whether we are able or not to do certain things. And there's times where in our inability to us to be able to do things, but you know, that's not way with God. That's not the same way with God. God has power beyond what man has and he can do whatever he sets out to do. Job recognized that. He said that you, you can do all things. You can, there's nothing that's too hard for you to do. As Job would basically say about God. And so we understand God has that kind of power to do the things he's, he can raise us because he proved it by raising his son, Jesus, from the dead. As he died on the cross of Calvary and was raised just like he said he would raise his son. Now, what does hope do? What hope does, it causes us to rejoice, first of all. In Romans 12, verse 12, it says, Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. And these, these kind of admonitions that Paul gives us, we ought to rejoice in hope. If I could put a picture of somebody shouting to the top of their lungs the hallelujah or or that we're to to rejoice in god and happy is he that's in the lord you can see that picture of a man who's on the mountaintop rejoicing because of the salvation that he has he's persevering tribulation he's devoted to prayer because he's a child of god he has that hope that's the great blessing of being a child of god is that hope we have in christ in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, the Bible says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Now, they may be rejoicing about being able to cast out demons. It says that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. He said, don't be so quick to rejoice about that alone, but simply rejoice even more about the fact that your name is recorded in heaven. That's what it's all about. Because if we miss heaven, we missed it all. And that's why we need to have more rejoicing in that than anything else. Do we think about heaven every day? Do we have that hope of heaven? If we are trusting in God and doing what he says, then that's a real place. That's a real hope for us that we can have when this life is over. What this hope does, it keeps us pure from sin. That's why we do the things we do in service to God, because we want to stay away uh, from sin as best as we possibly can. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 tells us, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we see him just as he is. Now, verse 3 is what I want to look at. It says, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. That says a lot about how we live the Christian life. And God does not automatically keep us from sin. We have to have that because of our hope, because I want to go to heaven. That's why I'm not going out and going to the bars and the, going out and getting alcohol and, and committing fornication or adultery or, or, or go out there robbing banks and, or telling lies or even just simply trying to live a double life as, as a child of God even someone who's trying to live a life of hypocrisy. You know, our hope needs to be real. 
And it needs to be based upon the fact that we're trying to purify ourselves. We're trying to do what God says in helping us to be what we need to be in Christ. You know, the gospel does that. The word of God, if we'll live by it, it gives us that hope that we purify ourselves. You know, that's God working through all that process of helping us repent of our sins and helping us to be purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. As we mentioned, first John one, seven through nine in the lesson last Sunday about this particular point. What this hope does, it gets us through difficult times as well. There are times in your life you'll have difficult moments, times you need the Lord more than anything else. And that's what I want to say is what Romans five, two through five says, through him or through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing what tribulation brings about. Tribulation brings about perseverance. And so we understand there's times we'll have difficult times. This idea of tribulation goes hand in hand with the life of a child of God. Paul would say, yea, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. That just goes with the territory of being a, a child of God because we live in a world that oftentimes mistreats and even hates children of God. Verse 4 says, in perseverance, proven character, and proving character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was, who was given to us. Again, this says a lot about we live a life of service to God, and we patiently, perseveringly do all the things we do. That, because of our hope, gets us through. You know, it's the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. You know, oftentimes we want the, the stress, the suffering to go away, and we rightfully so. We, we don't want to live a life of pain and, and suffering, but also this builds us our character. It also gets us to trust in God even more before this difficult time came into our lives. This, it's really what gets us through. It's not the fact that well, this, all this is going to go away. We know it's going to go away eventually because even if we leave this world in death, we know there's a better time that God gives us a hope of heaven and that that will be the greatest thing that could ever happen to us is to have that place with that peace with God and the absence of all suffering will have, have ended forever throughout all the endless ages. And so the, there's times of difficult storms in our lives and this hope during the storms of life when loss and sickness and persecution and suffering and death, when that happens to us, and it touches all people at all times. There's times, well, not all times, but there'll be times in everyone's life there'll be loss and sickness and persecution if you're a child of God especially, and suffering and death comes to all of us. But I want you to think about what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, or actually verse chapter 6, verse 19. It's hard to read that print, but it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure both sure and steadfast is what other translations have about this. It's what it says. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. That's really what all of what the Hebrew writer says about in that verse. What about this? It says this is concrete like an anchor. You know the purpose of an anchor on a ship is? And when you drop the anchor, you're trying to have that, that ship to stay in a firm location. You're not wanting it to be tossed or, or around by the waves or, or simply lose its place because it's gone too far. You want that, that ship to stay right there. And that's exactly what the anchor does. It, it pins that location. We need to have our location pinned, if you will, by the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, by the, the promises of God, this, this hope that we have in God. That's what roots and grounds us to the promises of God and, and all the fulfillment of that. That's what gives us the hope that we have, that like the anchor. And it helps us in those times of when we're just like that ship in the sea that's, that's simply lost in the waters. We have an anchor because that anchor is Christ who has done so much for us in our salvation. 
I want to conclude this lesson by talking about Romans chapter 8. Go back to the book of Romans. I love this particular chapter because it, it's all about spiritual life. It's all about the hope that we have in Christ and in God. In Romans chapter 8, I want to begin with verse 18 down to verse 25. Notice it talks about, I mentioned during the storms of life. I mentioned, I failed to put, this is after the storms of life. You know, one time all storms will cease. One day all the turbulence, the winds and all that. Remember when the disciples in, in Matthew 8, they were on the boat with Jesus. And they just saw the waves. All Jesus had to do was peace be still. And he said, he just hushed the storm and it just stopped. One day all the storms of life will hush and that Jesus will be the cause and reason for all of that. The Bible tells us in verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time not to be not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. I'm going on to say that the creation itself will, not, will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly, notice that, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, or our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? That goes back to what we read at the beginning of this lesson about our definition of hope. Paul said it's based upon us having the salvation of our bodies and going and, and, and having eternal life with God in heaven. The Bible tells us in verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. And that's where we are right now. We're in that state of eagerly with perseverance waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. If you are today thinking about this lesson today, how it's a lesson that talks about what we do and who we are as, as people of God, and yet one day it's going to be, we're going to see the fulfillment of all of those things. One day we will see Jesus. One day we'll see God. And now what a glorious day that will be. We sing about that oftentimes. What a glorious day that will be. And that's really talking about the fulfillment of that. And I'm thankful, thankful that you're able to with us today. Thankful that I've been able to talk about these things and to share some things from the scripture, some thoughts about the word of God. And I hope to bless everyone. I know several more I could have talked about in Kentucky, uh, several friends, and, and I hope to see them pretty soon. I'm going back to Kentucky, hopefully, in just a few weeks, and we'll see them and have a good time with them. Thank you very much for your kind attention lesson today. Uh, we'll now conclude with the Bible lesson.